Hi there, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Hope everyone's having a great 4th of July weekend, or Independence Day as I like to call it. We're going to continue on in our study through this uh, amazing first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. Thank you for joining us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, just want to thank you so much for just the opportunity that you've given us that you continue to give us to just to come together and feast upon your word. We're so very grateful for the outpouring of grace that we've received from you. So very grateful for one another. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth and truth alone, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So if you'd turn with me to 1 Timothy for just a moment. The first chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'd like you to look at verse 16. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to eternal life, to life everlasting that Jesus Christ would show forth a pattern of all long suffering. So we're not studying Paul's ideas, Paul's thoughts. Uh, we're studying the word of the sovereign God. These are not Paul's personal ideas on how a Christian ought to live. This is God's word and God is speaking through Paul as a pattern, as an example for us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so many people seem to think that if we are, are Christians living, you know, uh, as if we're just living like we ought to live, then everything is going to be great. And, you know, uh, Paul had nothing but problems when he did that. We found that if a brother was offended by his eating meat of any kind, he wouldn't eat meat as long as the world stood. And that closed the eighth chapter. Now, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are again dedicated to Christian liberty. Uh, I believe many chapters here on that subject. Paul is free, and in our last video we reached the 19th verse, I am free from all men. Paul is free. He does have liberty. If he's free to eat whatever he wants to eat, drink whatever he wants to do, all things are lawful for me. They're not all expedient, they're not all profitable, but they are lawful. I am not under law, I'm under grace. He's free. Nail that fact down hard, okay? We, we have to stick with the context. He's free in these areas of Christian liberty. He absolutely is. Nobody has any control over him in those things. It isn't the purpose, it's not the purpose of the church to teach you how to, you ought to spend your money, how you ought to treat your wife, how you ought to raise your kids. It is to teach you the finished work of Jesus Christ. This book is a book which teaches us of Christ and what He's done for us. That's what this book is. And we can get so involved in minutia that we lose sight of the fact that, that this isn't a rule book for our life. It is a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You search the Scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. And that's what we're reading. Paul is free from all men, yet with that liberty he's made himself a servant. Well, that's interesting. Now bear in mind, this is God speaking through Paul. Christ made Paul a servant unto all that he might gain the more. Now, as I pointed out in my last video, I'm not in any way trying to demean Paul. I think he was a great guy. I mean, if you want a, a hero, a Christian hero, if you're looking for a Christian hero, you know, you can't really do better than Paul. Maybe Daniel, Moses, but boy, Paul's got to at least be right up there at the top. Highly educated, tremendously dedicated. But is that, folks, is that what this is? Is, is, this, is God writing a eulogy for Paul? Or is Paul a sinner redeemed by grace, just like you, just like me? And is God working in Paul's life as he works in our life? 
Yes, the answer is yes. And I do not believe it is the Holy Spirit's purpose to exalt Paul. I believe God is showing how he worked through Paul as a pattern for us. And so he is made a servant unto all that he might gain the more. And I, I talked a little about that word gain. Let's bear in mind the context. He hasn't made Paul a servant unto all that he, that he might mow their lawn, repair, fix their, their car, or any other thing you might think of, paint their house, whatever. His purpose of slavery to others is that he might gain the more. And I made it clear that I believe these are all Christians. He isn't making himself a servant so that he can somehow get people redeemed so that they, uh, you know, they were headed for hell, now they're headed for heaven. Not at all. He's enduring all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I can't imagine a better verse of Scripture to distinguish between the concept of salvation and the concept of redemption, two entirely separate, different terms, He's not enduring all things for everybody. He's not a servant for everybody. He's a servant for the elect, God's people. Why, why do the elect need to be gained is, would be my question. The, or the non-elect. Uh, why would the non-elect be... All right, I'm getting a little muddled here. First of all, why would the non-elect need to be gained? Okay, they're non-elect. Second of all, why are the redeemed, why do they need to be gained why do those who are his need to be gained that's the question that should be before us here most of god's redeemed people headed for heaven are not rescued only redeemed people can be saved and somehow we have this modern evangelistic effort that is a hundred well i want to say a hundred percent ninety percent arminian and it places a responsibility on you for determining your destiny and it leaves the option open uh, for you to choose heaven or hell. That's the popular belief among Christians today. I'm sure that if someone took a poll, I'm sure that that's 90% of modern Christianity or somewhere up there in that range. There are Christians who, by the score, who will say that God's in control and they say that so flippantly until something really bad happens when they they really haven't grasped the fact that God really is in control. God is not having Paul become the servant to Christians to get them redeemed. Nothing happens to Paul by accident. He's led and, and directed by God. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. If He did not die in your place, you're not redeemed. It's just that simple. You are not redeemed because you believed, received, accepted, repented, was baptized, or anything else or because you made Christ Lord of your life, or you were, or you know, or whatever else they've added to that list since the last time I've done a video. Either the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you, or it wasn't. And people don't like that. Boy, does that make people mad. They, they want to be the captain of their ship. They want to be the, de the determiner of their destiny. And dearly beloved, I'm glad I'm not. Had God left the choice up to me whether to go to heaven or hell, without a doubt, I would have chosen hell. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They are spiritually discerned. Christ's death on the cross in your place presents you holy. You have been presented before God, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. Not something... That's not by something that you do that that happens. So there are redeemed people in the scriptures. They're called sheep. They're called his elect. There are unredeemed people in those scriptures called goats and tear. And there's the they and and there and then there's the them, and we are the we and the us. And why are so many people repulsed by the idea that God chose a family? That God has a family. Satan has, Satan's got a family. When the Lord speaks of the, of the tear, He says, These are the sons of the devil. He says to the Pharisees, You are of your father, the devil. If the devil's their father, God's not their father. So if you are a child of God, you are, re you are redeemed. And then we have this word saved. And I pointed this out in, I don't know, 
countless num numbers of videos have the distinction between those two words. I pointed out we have five gains here. We get down to the word save in verse 22. These Jews that he became a Jew to are Christian Jews. And so he's living like a Jew so that he can fellowship with them. And in that fellowship and in that communion, teach them more and more about what Jesus Christ did for them. Christ forgave you of all your sins. Every sin you've ever committed was future when He forgave them. You, couldn't, you can't send that up. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But how far, folks, how far have we grown? How much do we trust Him? How much do we rest in Him? And how much do we praise Him? I think we are looking at God's concern for all of His people here. There is no reason in the world for Jesus Christ to pattern Paul in such a way that he's dealing with non-elect children of Satan. I did not sow the tear, he said. An enemy did this. You Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and his deeds you will do. There isn't any transfer of, of fatherhood from the devil to God, folks. You are either God's child or Satan's child. You're either one or the other. You never had any choice in, the, in that matter. And that makes people mad. You never had any choice in who your human parents were. That didn't seem to make people mad. That ought to be clear. Why should it be such a shocking thing for me to believe that I didn't have any opportunity to choose who my father was? When you didn't either. I didn't have any control over the fact that God chose me before the foundation of the world and He ordained that Jesus Christ, the God of very God, would become incarnate and die as my substitute. These are Christian Jews, but they aren't very far advanced in their understanding of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The predominant Christian activity today is, is figuring out how much to give, where to put it, what mission to support, and how we ought to live our lives, and all of this kind of stuff, but very little comprehension about the person and the work of Jesus Christ who created the heavens and the earth and who was willing, yet willing to walk the dirty streets of the city of Jerusalem to to put up with the jeers and the taunts of those who placed a crown of thorns on his head and nailed him to a cross for me and for you. When he could have destroyed them all with just you know, a blink of his eye, but he didn't. Why? Because he loved me and because he loved you. These are Christian Jews and my purpose is that I might gain them. You see, you do have certain liberties. The natural man doesn't. He doesn't have that liberty. He doesn't have that ability, but you as a new creation in Christ Jesus do. But God has not in, ordained it in such a way that every one of us who are His children come out of the cradle and, and know all scriptural truth. That's what's astounding to me, that Christians who are are thankful that they're going to heaven, that Jesus Christ redeemed them, even these individuals, those who have eternal security, who rest in that, they seem to have very little interest in learning more and more about the one who died in their place. But God is declaring that He has ordained Paul as an example of those who should hereafter believe He is our example, that I might gain them that are under law to them that are without law, probably Gentiles. So we're looking at Jews and Gentiles both. So I'm going to live like each, each one of the other. I'm going to live like a Gentile, live like a Jew. That was the dispute that Paul had with Peter on the Galatian, Gentile being not without law to God, but, but under Christ's law, that I might gain them that are without law, Gentiles. Now this is God speaking. He's made Paul a pattern. It's God's desire that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And that growth is slow. And that growth is, can be very painful. It is 
utterly astounding how little interest there is in the Christian community uh, today, in the age in which we live, in learning more and more Scripture about Christ. They're just happy to know that they're redeemed and they're going to heaven if they know that, even, you know, if they even know that. And they're doing good works, trotting along with little comprehension of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and looking at their motive as to why they're working, why they're doing what they're doing. What does Paul mean by gain? That he might gain some. Well, not to get them redeemed. They are redeemed. But to draw them into a deeper understanding of who they are in Christ. This was Paul's burden that God put on him. Wouldn't you like to know that your Father is Creator of heaven and earth, that He's the sovereign God, that He has all power, and really understand who He is and, and what He does? And I'm sorry, but those folks who are not God's people are going to wind up in hell, and God wants you to know that. He's not pulling any punches. In verse 22, till the weak became I as weak. This is a brother who is called weak because of his conscience, and you're surrounded by these people. And as I mentioned, blessed is the man, fortunate is the man whose heart does not condemn him in that which he allows, which means there is a conscience. And I believe it, it is, it's a uh, God-given conscience. I believe it's God-given, and our context tells us that I'm not going to do anything that violates the conscience of a brother because God loves that brother every bit as much as He loves me. God loves that person in the same way that He loves me. He died in that person's place as He died in my place. This is a weak Christian. Imagine, you know, to those who are weak, I became weak. I, I don't believe the Holy Spirit is saying that He is now a weak Christian. I believe the text is saying that He respects the conscience of that weak brother. There's all kinds of cases of that. And you all do have personal convictions. Look, look you have five gains there in the text, and it winds up with save in verse 22. And these words mean what they mean. Save means saved. Gain means gained. Save is a Greek word that means to rescue. Nobody, nobody has ever rescued a dead person. The only people that can be saved, rescued, are people who are alive, people who have been redeemed. They may be pretty weak. They may be living under law. They may be in any one of these difficulties that we're looking at, but they are spiritually alive. Folks, people who have no idea who another person is, they'll risk their lives to try to save them. But Christians, if that guy thinks that, you know this is wrong or that's wrong, let him go. Don't, don't deal with him. Don't bother with the guy. Friends and people, we don't even know. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, we're to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness and gentleness. We don't do that. No, no, we separate ourselves from that guy because he's nuts. His doctrine is pathetic. I don't want anything to do with it. But if he has some kind of physical illness, a tragedy, a, a serious accident, well, man, well, now we go out of our way to help the guy. And we don't even know who these folks are. Why, why is it unreasonable that God would expect us to act the same way with brothers and sisters in Christ? These are Jews who need to learn more and more about Christ. They need help. And then there are those Gentiles. They need help. They need understanding too. They need understanding and they need compassion. You do it for a sick person, why wouldn't you do it for a, a sick elect? Maybe I shouldn't call them sick, but, but they need the same kind of compassion and help that we would give to another human who was in serious difficulty. And I do this for the Gospel's sake. It's done for the gospel's sake that we might share with one another the wonderful truth of the finished work of, of Christ. Verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. And I, oh, Steve, I just want to get to heaven. I don't care about a reward. 
And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Huge hint as right there in the context as to what he's talking about. Bama. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beats the air, boxes the air. But So there's purpose. He knows where he's going here. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway, and now I'm going to hell. Seriously, folks? Is that how you read that? Verses 24 and 25 are obviously based upon the sports games, which is a basis for our word agony. Training for athletics is agony, and Christians do that for a ribbon or a trophy or a medal or, or whatever, so you know, or a hug or, you know, a kiss or, you know, so why wouldn't they do that for the gospel's sake, for the sake of God's elect, to gain them, rescue them from anything that would hinder them from growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. Why? Why are we more willing to do it for an athletic event than we are for eternal value? Every man that strives for mastery this way is tempered in all the things that he does. Some, sometimes Christians let the praise go to their heads and then they're not as tempered as they ought to be. But, but those who are faithful do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. That corruptible crown won't last. Therefore I so run, but bear in mind, Christ has ordained that Paul be the example. He ordained his run. So this is the only, this, this is the Holy Spirit giving us the prototype that Christ has made I so run, says Paul. He gave us a very specific run, and, and it's not with uncertainty. I know what I'm doing. My crown is not corruptible. I fight not as one beating the air. I'm not missing the target. My blows are not landing on the air. They're landing on my body. The very thing, the one, the one that I'm fighting is myself. Okay, I keep under my body the flesh. That's where your battle really is. That's, that's the big source of your problem. The works of the flesh are these. We, saw, we see those in Galatians. They that are in the flesh can't please God, and, and, and it is a fight. It's real easy to follow the flesh. It's a fight. Okay, It is a constant fight. I subdue my body and then bring it into subjection. That's what? To, to the law? No. No. To the law of Christ. That word keep there is an interesting Greek word. I hit myself under the eye. I don't hit the air. I, I, ha I know where I'm going or what I'm doing. The word means I hit myself under the eye. Why do I do that? Lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Bad translation in my opinion. Disqualified is what the word means. Now, the Arminian just goes wild with this verse. Being a castaway means you were headed for heaven, but now you're going to hell. And Paul didn't really know whether or not he was going to heaven or going to hell. He worried about being a castaway, eternally lost, rejected by God, condemned to hell. And that why? Why? Because he over what? Exercised his liberty because he didn't gain or save his brethren? You Folks, you can't do that with the text. You'd throw out any number of scriptures. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Did God lie? No man is able to snatch them out of my hand. These folks, these are not idle truths. These are biblical truths. The word means disqualified, a word that means I, I think there's gold there, and I'm going to test it to prove it. That's literally what the word means. Is it possible then for a Christian to spend his life in human works and be disqualified? Absolutely. Absolutely. We saw that earlier in this study. If any man's work shall fail, he'll suffer loss. The wood, hay, stubble will be burned up. The gold, silver, precious stone will remain. How many people do you suppose there are who have taught that which is not biblical uh, truth and taught it with a passion they're dedicated, they're, they've dedicated their lives to it just to find out that their life's work was driven by, motivated by the flesh, not the spirit. You're not going to be judged for sin, folks. We're going to give an account on how we built on 
Jesus Christ. And how did we do that? That's our contest here. Well, the Word. And that's the game. Building on Jesus Christ. Bringing these people to rescue them from the law. Hebrews 10, if you're redeemed and you understand the work of Christ, you would have no more consciousness of sin. Hebrews 10. Isn't that wonderful? He has That He's perfected forever those whom He set apart. How is it then that there's so much teaching Paul wasn't you know, perfected forever. You know, see, he, Steve, Steve, you, Paul can lose it here. He's not losing anything. But his works are disqualified. So he fights a battle to make sure that they're not disqualified. You need that this book to do that, folks. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to spend the time as an athlete spends his time in preparing his body and his mind and training and his discipline in his diet and whatever else? Are we willing to do that to make sure that we are teaching biblical truth? I worry about that. I'd love to say that there's never been any biblical error in my teaching. I'd love to say that, you know, it'll all just be gold, silver, and precious. Folks, I can't do that. I know that no man has a corner on truth, but my prayer every day is, Lord, that which is ignorant, that which is false, that which is foolish, strip it away, filter it out, so that you grow, I grow, so that I grow in grace and knowledge of you in, in the finished work of Christ, of what He's done for me. I don't want to be disqualified and find out I'm not teaching the truth. And folks, the burden's on you, you as the, the noble Berean Christians who were exhorted by this same Holy Spirit to search the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be true. The burden's on you to build upon that one foundation which is Christ. You can't build on any other. Not law. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. Go back and read it. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For no other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide in which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall become a castaway. He shall himself shall be rejected. but he, he shall be saved, yet so is by far. For sure, Paul wrote these words, but he was not the author. God is, and he's speaking to us. We see ourselves in this passage. We're going to see ourselves here as either one or the other. Either one, as one, either, either as one who is building upon Christ, his person, his word, or one who is building upon the foundation of self, human performance, human merit, flesh, law, were that liberty is, is seen as a license to sin. I, you know, it's, it's amazing. All the chapters devoted to Christian liberty, and someone tells me, Steve, that, you know, that's just a license to sin. Or the vine is only seen as a, some God to be appeased, you know, to be made happy by our personal devotion to personal achievement rather than our devotion to the very embodiment of grace and truth. That is the book. That faulty foundation of sin, self, or that success is thought to depend upon our own will rather than the sovereign will of God, our own guidance, our own direction, our own will, our own strength, our own efforts, our own, our own, just us. It's all about us. When God works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure, how do you want Him to work in you? Sure, that Corinthians were acting fleshly because they were not building upon Christ. They were not viewing one another as in Christ. They weren't viewing one another themselves as one body in Christ. 
It's the branch not abiding in the vine, John 15. And we will see as we continue on how that this theme of grace and truth as it concerns Christian liberty is the very truth whereby God gains and delivers His people. Now you can say that this was Paul's heart. Well, that's, that's awfully nice of Paul. This is his part. It's, we're looking at his heart for, for God's people here. You can do that if you want. I'm sure that was true. But it would not have been true if it were not for God's will for us. This is God's will for us. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.